Hello, I'm Pastor Bill Vigu of Meet of the Word Ministries. You're watching a program we call Let Us Go On. Now, I had some problems on my own personal social media so I'm going to, uh, from last week, so I'm going to repeat a few things in today's message uh, just to clarif clarify and answer some of the questions that I did receive from call-ins and emails. Uh, but I, I want to start first by mentioning a book that I highly regard, has some tremendous points in it. I had read it back in 1983, 84, something like that, and it was called The New Wave of the Holy Spirit. Now, while there was some tremendous teaching involved in it, the uh, message or the title was misleading, The New Wave of the Holy Spirit. And just recently I looked at that book and I examined it and I, I thought about the title and I said to myself, there's no such thing as a new wave of the Holy Spirit. God's not going to do something new or do something different than he's ever done before. There's no new thing under the earth, so there certainly is no new thing in the hand of God. And uh, so it's not so much a new wave of what God is doing in the earth today, rather it's a uh, a an, un, uh, an understanding that God has provided everything for us. Actually, in the very first generation, let me read this, everything we needed, everything we need to know about the Holy Spirit is found in the New Testament, the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as the book of Acts, that entire first generation. Everything we need to know and understand about the, the Holy Spirit is there. It literally explodes on the pages. It explains to us exactly what God is, uh, ha was going to do in this new covenant, new, uh, new uh, uh, relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So it's not new. It's just something that we lost over the centuries, over the history. Uh, mankind got spoiled, particularly Christians got spoiled and uh, were deceived. That's a very important understanding. The Bible talks about a massive deception uh, that's going to take place against the body of Christ, against Christians and Jewish believers in the Messiah, in, in Christ Jesus, and that, that's the major character of the devil. Now Jesus had said that the devil was a liar, the father of all lies, but he uses lies to deceive and it's deception that is the uh, most destructive element. Jesus warned us against it, the Apostle Paul warned us against it. So we'll talk about that. Matter of fact, let me read this. This is from 2nd uh, Thessalonians, the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Again, the first generation of Christians where it explodes on the pages in the scriptures, the explanation of all that the Holy Spirit is going to do. And he says here, and this is chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, his second letter to the church in Thessalonica, uh, chapter 2, the Apostle Paul now explains something that's very significant. Again, I encourage you to read your own Bible, examine it. We are living in the days, the last days, and really the, these last days are last days of deception. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to have our rights stolen. We don't want to have our, the, our experience with the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit taken away from us through deception. We don't want to sit idly by as Christians and be non-productive in this world and, and not fulfill the Great Commission or even understand the Great Commission, let alone going about doing the Great Commission. So listen to what the Apostle Paul said. This was not written back in the days of Martin Luther. This is written in the first generation. He says this, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming, talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the literal coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. This is a reference to a particular uh, rapture, our gathering to him, us being caught up together with him. He says in verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by a spirit 
nor by someone's words, nor by someone's letter, as if it, uh, as if it even came from me, the Apostle Paul, basically is what he's saying here, as that day of Christ is at hand. He says this, verse 3, let no man deceive you. Now this is our responsibility. If you're deceived, you're deceived by letting some man under the inspiration of the devil and his particular character of deception. And, and again, the warning is, let no man deceive you by uh, any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin, the Antichrist he's referring to, the man of sin, uh, the son of perdition, uh, uh, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the throne of God, showing himself that he is God. This is going to be the last day Antichrist. Now the spirit of Antichrist has been in the world you know, since the beginning of time, fighting against blaspheming God and the Holy Spirit. But here it's talking about a literal end time personality, a human being who will have a sidekick called the false prophet. He, he's going to go about deceiving all Jews, getting them to believe a lie, getting them to make peace, and they'll say peace and safety when sudden destruction will take place. He's going to sit on the throne. He's going to finally voice his word against God. He's going to defy God. He's going to curse God, it says. And the Apostle Paul says, uh, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? He tells us, I told you these things. So we don't have to look for some new revelation from God that we've never heard from. This has already been told us that we've already had the warning given to us. Verse 10 says, For with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Again, we're talking about a great, massive, destructive deception that you do not want to fall prey to. Now, again, let me repeat this. Everything that we need to know or ever will need or needed to know about the Holy Spirit is found in the Scriptures, found in, and, and happened, experienced in the first generation of Christians. That's why God gave us the, the teachings of, him, of the Lord Himself, Jesus Himself, as well as the book of Acts and the profound things, the profound acts that the disciples did once they were empowered of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, this coverage, this explosion and revelation and insight of the Holy Spirit found in all the scriptures before we were spoiled and we de declined into the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the Medieval Ages. Uh, this included the new, uh, first, that all men must repent, not just a select group of people that were predestined by God to be damned, and the, and the rest of the world, or, or the rest of the people that were really believers, they will all be saved because God was the creator, God the potter. He created some good, some bad. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the, the move of the Holy Spirit. The move of the Holy Spirit is saying that God has declared that all men are unrighteous. All men and their deeds are as filthy rags, and that all men need to repent. That's the first revelation, the first teaching of the Holy Spirit. Repent, then to be born again. Then you have the Pentecostal experience or the Pentecostal message, which we'd also today call the charismatic movement. Uh, then we'd also have the doctrine of baptisms. Water baptism it includes, uh, is included as well as the baptism into the body of Christ, which refers to the new birth, but also the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we've got to explain to new Christians today. Then we've also got a revelation of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit within the believers. This empowerment was seen in somebody like uh, now, Ananias, who was spoken to by God, had a personal relationship with God. They talked like you, know, you and I can converse at the dinner table. And, he, and, and God, through the Holy Spirit, told Ananias to go and see a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. 
He has had a, you know, a vision of a man by your name, Ananias, come in, lay hands on him so that he would be healed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias, you know, questioned this, but the Lord said, he's my servant. So we see the empowerment. We also see the empowerment in men like the Apostle Peter where he went and raised people from the dead, where he went into the streets and, he, and the very shadow, his very shadow, caused people to be healed from their deathbed, from stretchers. And they'd bring the sick out into the streets, not even in the church or a temple building or anything like that, but in the streets, just to have the shadow of the anointing of the apostle Peter uh, fall upon them and suddenly be empowered and feel the touch. And not just the feeling, of the Holy Spirit, not just the goosebumps of the Holy Spirit, but the power applied in their body so that they were physically, mentally, and medically uh, uh, come alive. They were, they were supernaturally empowered. Also, you've got the resurrection, the very first part, the first phase of the resurrection. Jesus, of course, was resurrected, but the Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 52, and verse 53, that the graves were open and many that had died and were buried in their graves came to life again. They rose from the dead and they walked into the city of Jerusalem and people that knew them and knew and, and helped bury them and had their funeral saw these men literally raised from the dead. Then you've also got believers uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit being prepared and equipped for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we're supposed to be. Are you a wise candidate or are you a foolish candidate as a Christian and as a believer? The, the Bible says the wise will be ready, they'll be prepared, they will go on to be with the Lord. Those that are unwise, unprepared, that did not keep their oil, that did not trim their, their, their lamps, uh, did not keep the Holy Spirit living and abiding on the inside of them and on fire, that they won't, be, they won't have enough for when the Lord comes initially, the first coming of the Lord, and the door, we're told Jesus said, and the door <coughs> Excuse me. He said, and the door shall be closed. And then they will wonder all, all about that. Also, in regards to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the, of the Holy Spirit, all that we need to know, and all that the first generation of believers understood in regards to the Holy Spirit, was that there was a great commission. Christians were not just to get born again and be satisfied. Thank God I'm going to heaven with that mentality. I don't want any more. I don't want to learn any more. I don't want to know any new, fresh realities of the Holy Spirit. I'm content with where I am. I don't want to grow. I don't want to be a part of fulfilling the Great Commission. But the Great Commission is there and revealed to us in the first generation of Christians on the pages of, script, of Scripture. Also, the ascension of the Holy Spirit, those that are in Christ, First, God raised up Jesus, but he didn't just raise him up from the dead. He not only raised him up from the dead, but b bottom line is he raised him up and brought him into the heavens and sat him down at his own right hand. The ascension is very important for you. You can't just fly up to heaven on your own. You can't get in a, a jet plane or a, a, you know, a space shuttle and go to heaven. You might be able to make it to moon. We might in, even in our generation make it to Mars some way or somehow. I don't understand all that, but you'll never make it up into the third heavens without the Holy Spirit. Well, the ascension is part of it. Then also the new, what? well, we, I don't like to use the word new, but the revelation, the new reality uh, of that we are seated with him in Christ. Christians are beginning to get on fire for God and recognize that now we are the sons of God. That now, not when we get to heaven, but right now we have the Holy Spirit. We can do the things that uh, any believer can do. We can do these things, and we're seated with Him in heavenly places. And of course, this is very important for us to understand the connection with end-time Bible prophecies. Now, let's talk for a moment about the history of the decline of the Christian faith during the Dark Ages, after the first generation. By the time we got to the second, third, fourth generation of Christians, they slowly seeped into darkness. They lost truth.
They did not, I mean, even to the place today where there are many so-called born-again Christians, and I believe that there are many born-again, legitimately born-again Christians. Not everybody that says that they're a Christian is a Christian, but I believe that there are legitimate born-again Christians uh, in the world today that are, you know, well, first, not satisfied with what they've got in the things of God, and they want more. Thank God for that. That's, one, uh, that's where I am, and, and where, what I preach and teach the people that will listen to what I have to say, let's go on. I want to move on. But uh, it's important to s uh, notice that there was a decline right up into the Dark Ages. And then, of course, we had the Great Reception, I mean, the Great Reformation that took place. Now, for instance, the book of the New Testament book of Romans written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians that were in the city of Rome at that time, he discusses the fall of Israel, a nation that at the time of the Reformation, even when Martin Luther came on the scene, they could not understand because the nation no longer existed in their time. And as a result, it's not difficult to understand that the medieval mindset that they'd been influenced with, uh, uh, did, uh, they, they, as a result, did not comprehend the prophetic messages concerning the nation of Israel, concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and concerning the Christian church today and its activity in the world and its influence in not only spiritual things, but even in the political things. Yes, we are supposed to speak out against the ills and the bad politics. Now, Martin Luther, for instance, he is considered one of the fathers of the, uh, of, of the faith, of the new reformation that took place. And he had two significant things that were very predominant. One was that he taught, he, he saw, he recognized, he realized that there was such a thing as the um, uh, living by faith, not living by the works like the nation of Israel had tried to do. They had tried to have their own righteousness. They couldn't obtain that. And God had to reject them, cut them off from a relationship with Him because they did not come to Him by faith. Gentiles in our generation today, and really from the beginning of the New Testament, were now allowed to come into the faith if they came the right way. And that was faith in the grace and the mercy of God. Not in being good enough, not in serving God in enough deeds or anything like that. So Martin Luther, he recognized the teaching men or, or the just, the justified shall live by faith. And then another significant thing he did was to politically and, and spiritually point out the faults of the church and, and the church world at that time. And he wrote a 95-point thesis against the Roman Catholic Church. Now, by the way, Luther was not just anti-Catholic church doctrine during that period. He was actually an anti-Jew. He, did, he thought the Jews had been rejected. He was very cold. He did not have the mindset that we have today, that Israel ha is a great nation, that Israel has come back, and that Israel is a part of the plan of God, that God wants to engraft them back in, but they've got to come the right way. And that is, again, by faith. And so um, we need to understand that as the Reformation took place, Martin Luther coming on the scene, he survived. They wanted to put him to death. But before him, there were two other men that were literally getting a hold of the same message that Martin Luther had. Martin Luther had it in the late 1500s, but there was a man by the name of John Severola, uh, uh, John Huss first in the 1300s, who got a revelation of these things and was opposing some of the false doctrines that were taking place. He was burned at the stake. Then another man in, in, um, in Italy, uh, Savonarola, he too got the message. He too tried to correct and warn the church. He had a prophetic instinct. He, he, he prophesied even when he was going to die and he was accurate. Uh, when the Pope was going to die, uh, he was accurate. You know, an eight, you know, it took eight years for the prophecy to be fulfilled, but it happened just as Savannarola. Well, he was tricked into coming into, coming into an inquisition and there they put him in prison. 
gave him an opportunity to denounce these things that he was saying and speaking against the Catholic Church, both spiritually, doctrinally, and politically, what was going on. And he was put to, uh, uh, put to death, burned at the stake. John Huss, particularly, what I like about him, he died singing praises to God as he was burning. So these men were definitely empowered with the Holy Spirit. But again, after the, the decline into the dark ages of the middle, middle Ages, there was a slow process of recovery. Not a new wave of the Holy Spirit, but new realities that began to take place in the members of the body of Christ. Now, going back to the point where we can understand that the uh, uh, the believers, the Christians, could not understand what God was prophetically saying about the, the nation of Israel uh, be, during the uh, Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, because they, you know, it, there was no nation that existed. But we're told there's a gradual increase, and this is what Jeremiah had said. And again, I'm not speaking you know, against these reformers, these men that were trying to recover the church back to its original state. They didn't necessarily see what the original state was. They did, did not recognize the fullness of the Holy Spirit as recorded in the book of Acts and the teachings of Jesus. But this is not to suggest that they were effortless scholars. They were scholarly. They were students of the Word of God. They were trying to learn. They were like uh, an important cog to the, to the move back to the things of God. They were scholarly, but it is to point out that the light in their generation was not as illuminating as it would be in the latter days. Now I want to read two references from the book of Jeremiah to explain this. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 20 says, The anger of the Lord shall not return. He was explaining about the tribulation period and the literal second coming of the Lord. He says the fierce anger, the great tribulation of the Lord, shall not return until he is, he is executed. Here he is referencing every Bible prophecy. Just as Jesus had to fulfill every Bible prophecy before he could die on the cross, he had to fulfill every scripture that was written of him and all of his sufferings in the latter days. God said, not as you assume necessarily, not of your opinion or my opinion or anybody's private interpretation, but just as the word of God has to say, it will be executed. He goes on to say, until he has performed the thoughts of his heart. And then he says this, in the latter days you shall consider it, or more literally, you will understand it perfectly. Now that is evidence that we are closing in on the latter days because we are understanding, coming more and more closer to the full realities of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Also in verse 24, Jeremiah said, again repeating the second coming, the fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he has done it everything and until he has performed the intents of his heart in the latter days you shall consider it or you shall understand it so it's important that we understand that now i want to just consider the history of the the 20th century so that we have an understanding of what was taking place we have these great leaders john alexander dowie and John G. Lake, who had a revelation and gifts of the Holy Spirit regarding divine healing. Multitudes of people were being healed at the turn of the century. Bosworth, Brennan, the great evangelists uh, like uh, um, Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, great teachers like Kenneth Hagin, they were on the scene. Now we have three groups of true, real Christians, and I used this before in an illustration. This is simply a washing machine plug here. And notice it has three prongs. I want you to notice. First prong, in my opinion, represents the born again, the true, real, born again Christian. Not just someone that says they're a Christian, but has been born again, but has remained there.
Second, you have the charismatic Christians that not only are born again, but they believe in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They believe in signs, wonders, and miracles of the Holy Spirit in the latter days. Then you have the third group, and that is the group that doesn't is not just satisfied with, wow, the blessing of, of the charismatic movement. God is with us. He loves us. And we got all this blessing, blessing, blessing. But this third group is a group of Christians that have also understood they have a responsibility. They want to grow. They want to move forward. They want to go on. Now, the, I have another I illustration here. This is a power source that goes into a light socket. This here, this is the source. You plug this in here to break it down into three sources now. Again, the born again experience, the charismatic movement, and then those that really want to move forward in the things of God that when connected, all three of these things are functioning and operating. And that is important. But what if one of them gets bent out of joint? And I'm using this one because I can't bend the bars on the on the oh, dishwashing you know, plug. But what if one born again Christian gets upset with the charismatics? Ah, oh, there's no, this is not, there's no more miracles. The only thing that's new is there's born again. And they get upset with the charismatic movement. They get bent out of shape. And then the charismatics say, well, man, these guys don't believe in the power of God and Pentecost and things like that. So they get bent out of shape. Now, how are you going to plug this in if they're all bent? I'm going to bend one really significantly. Can you imagine? I mean, you can't plug it in. It's meant to plug in. It, it's meant to have the power source of the Holy Spirit, but it can't, be, it can't plug in because it's bent out of shape. That's the way a lot of Christians are today. They're unhappy with each other or one of the other groups and things like that. We need to stop that because we need to plug in to what God wants to do in, our, in, our, in the latter days. We've got to plug in. So those are the three links, being born again, the second one being charismatic, believing in the power of God, but just relaxing in the blessing of it. Ooh, I'm all blessed because I got the Holy Spirit. And then those that are really understanding the spiritual realities who, of who they are, that now they are sons of God, that now they are not just merely born again, but they're, they've got a great commission to fulfill under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This is the important thing. This is what I want to bring out in this particular series. As we move forward, we'll talk about several, many things, many subjects. We'll talk about the potter and the clay. Uh, um, we'll explain certain things in the book of Romans that is terribly misunderstood. Uh, some, some of the things that have been carried over during the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, into the church world today, such as predestination and election. We'll deal with all of those things, try to do the best we can to help you get straightened out so that you can plug into the new things that God is doing. I have to close now. You have a wonderful day. God bless.